leverage in order to provide the contacts that our teams needed in order to uh, perform the things that they were doing. Uh, he also has a wealth of knowledge about doing business with the DOD uh, from many years of his experience on, on both sides of that. Uh, and Farzine is a uh, national instructor for the uh, uh, I-Corps uh, Innovation Institute. Uh, and he had a wealth of knowledge in the methodology that we were going to teach to the students in order to fulfill, to satisfy the missions, the charges, the problem statements that were presented by the various agencies. Uh, so uh, I thought this sounded like a great idea. Uh, that it would give students an opportunity to get hands-on experience working on real-world problems. I didn't quite realize at the time that the model was going to be flipped from the way that most of our engineering students think, but in a clearly beneficial way. That is, they were going to reach out and interview large numbers of individuals, beneficiaries of the problem, to try to understand what the problem really was. That's a little bit out of the comfort zone of, of, of some of our students. But when we announced this class, we marketed it not just to the School of Engineering. We marketed throughout the university, and we ended up with students from Marshall. Uh, we ended up with students from Dorn Flight. Uh, we ended up with students from other parts of the university. We even ended up with, although mostly graduate students, we ended up with one team that was composed entirely of undergraduate students. Uh, and we made sure that we assigned these students to the team so that there was a mix of backgrounds. Uh, and then with the able teaching of Farzine and Matt, uh, and then on some of the technical sides myself, uh, we ended up teaching them a new way of thinking about problems. Uh, so the end result is going to be what you are seeing tonight. Uh, this class couldn't have been taught without the support of, of uh, Farzine and Matt, and also, by the way, RTA in the class, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Ashok Deb, uh, U.S. Army, and also a Ph.D. student in computer science here in the Viterbi School of Engineering. So this team was really great in terms of being able to bring many perspectives that were taught to all the students. Uh, so you're going to hear presentations tonight from four teams that is the culmination of 14 weeks of work by these teams, you'll hear about the journey that they had through the process of discovery uh, and innovation uh, and designing solutions to problems that were not exactly the problems that were initially presented to them, but where they needed to learn what the real world problem was. Uh, so with that, uh, I am going to move into the first of our teams that is going to present. Uh, so, um, as we move through the teams, we're going to have different members of our teaching team that are going to introduce the different teams. I'm going to begin by introducing Team Turnstone. Uh, that is our only team that is composed entirely of undergraduate students. Uh, and they worked on a very challenging problem, uh, very difficult getting a grasp of what the real problem was. But they did that, and you're going to hear about it, a problem posed by the Department of State. Uh, allow me now to introduce uh, Mimi Zembeni, and she will introduce the rest of the team. My name is Mimi, and I'm a part of Team Princeton. So before we dive in, let me take you back to December when uh, Ben, Brian, Adam, and I were in Iceland for winter break, and Brian was telling us about H40. So Brian's our tech guy, and he's a senior majoring in CS uh, who loves to build stuff. Adam is majoring in economics and political science. He's also a senior, and he's our spreadsheets guy. Ben and I are both in Ivy and Young Academy, studying design, engineering, and business. And Ben's a junior, and I'm a sophomore. So fast forward two weeks later, we'd all signed up for the class, we thought it was super cool, and we found ourselves in a classroom full of graduate students, partnered with the State Department on a huge problem set of how about we actually identify, reach out to, and intervene in the lives of youth on the path to radicalization. And so today I'll tell you a little bit about how, with the help of our problem sponsor, uh, our mentors, and the teaching team, we 
were able to interview 70 people and narrow the scope of that problem down to how might we actually empower digital counter messaging teams to um, challenge radical narratives across the globe. And so the first problem set really boils down to online radicalization. White nationalist groups and the Islamic State are the first groups to have really secure territory in the digital radicalization space. And uh, these groups are the ones that send propaganda out to youth over platforms like Twitter and Facebook, um, but also through more private recruitment um, platforms like Telegram, which is encrypted. And that's where CVE comes in. So CVE, also known as Countering Violent Extremism, is a spectrum that um, encompasses both civilian and government initiatives used to counter violent extremism um, and violent terrorism. And so on the far left side, you have uh, family prevention or community prevention used to counter or prevent extremist thought. And that might look like a peace building or a religious tolerance workshop. A little bit farther down the line, you have community intervention. So that would be interdisciplinary teams made up of social workers, law enforcement officials, um, religious leaders, community leaders who all come together to actually create some kind of program and intervene in one individual's life. On um, the far right side, you have security action, um, which kicks in when extremist thought converts to extremist action. And so this and everything on the spectrum actually falls into CDE. And um, we are tasked with creating a digital intervention solution a little bit farther upstream. And the way we kind of started tackling this task was by talking to people. So we went to talks, we went to conferences, we got to Skype people all the way in Malaysia. This was a kind of native community Skype. Um, and we also got to talk to academics right at home. So we spoke to this uh, professor called Dr. Southers, who's an expert in homegrown radicalization. Um, and he and other academics really got us started in the US and Germany, where um, our interest as well as theirs pointed us towards white nationalism as you know, really important groups to focus on and create intervention programs for. By week five, we actually realized that our uh, problem sponsor's focus in CBE was not necessarily domestic and not necessarily in a developed country. And so Adam created this great spreadsheet uh, where we looked at maybe like different key metrics that would measure um, a country's uh, openness to an intervention program. So this could include a democracy index, um, presence of social workers on the ground, um, internet penetration, and we eventually focused on the Philippines. And that first week, we had no idea how to reach out to people, so Ben and I stayed up really late a couple of days to cold call a bunch of people, hospitals, social workers, you name it, no one wanted to talk to us. Um, but eventually, with the help of our problem sponsors, once we got in touch, we learned that the digital CD space in um, Southeast Asia is dominated not necessarily by intervention teams, but more so by counter-narrative teams. Because the reality of the situation is that there just aren't enough resources in the US, uh, not in the US, sorry, in developing countries and also in the US to actually employ dozens of officials, um, like, again, law enforcement officials, community leaders, uh, and social workers to create any full intervention program. And instead, an online scalable solution makes much more sense for countries that aren't the US or Germany. And that's how we would like to counter narrative teams. <coughs> so this team that we spoke to in Malaysia uh, was one of the first counter narrative teams we spoke to. And actually, um, they're the ones who gather and analyze recruitment messages that come in and then craft positive alternative narratives for youth who might be coming contact with these messages uh, in order to kind of nudge them off the path to radicalization. We learned that one of the biggest pain points they face is actually at the first step of their process, where the social media analyst might spend about 75% of her time or more actually trying to get these messages, so she'll screenshot messages and then drop them into folders on her desktop, uh, which is not only a huge time sink for her, but for her entire team who must rely entirely on her memory to reference any messages um, in order to create counter-narratives to them. So we learned that we could actually automate a great deal of this process in two stages. So at the first stage, we actually removed the screenshotting aspect of that current collection method and replaced it with screen scraping as well as pulling from Twitter and Telegram's APIs um, to populate some kind of interface where an analyst would be able to tag these messages. The same way they categorize them into folders, but instead creating some kind of tag data set of extremist messages. And with this data set, we'd be able to create a machine learning algorithm that would then uh, automatically sort this content for analysts into a searchable database, which could look something like this. And so with this type of database, analysts would be able to parse through messages by categories that they care about, um, like time that was posted, location it was posted in, as well as narrative views or grievance expressed in the message. Um, with this type of database, you'd be able to give back essentially 75% of an analyst's time to actually look at messages, spot patterns, and then create more effective counter-narratives to really better nudge, uh, nudge youths away from the path to violence or, or radicalization. 
So there's still a lot of work for us to do, and we actually created a proof of concept um, for the State Department, which we hope to hand off at the end of the semester. You can ask Brian a little bit about that. Um, there's a lot of work to do with their prom sponsors, but we hope to actually uh, work with them for a little bit longer to make sure that all the research from this semester gets turned into an increase in efficiency for these counter-narrative teams. Uh, one of our biggest lessons that we learned this semester was that um, military action alone cannot defeat an ideology. Communication is a really, really important part of countering violent extremism, uh, especially digital communication and counter-messaging. Both play key roles in this. So uh, with these learnings kind of on our, on our end, uh, Brian and Adam are both graduating in May. Ben and I are still in school, but we're really, really excited about um, the potential opportunities we have down the road for civic and government tech. And uh, at this point, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Well, I think you have validated the truism, uh, a firm belief of mine, which is that you can never have too many smart people in any organization, and that all you need to do is get seriously bright people and throw them at a problem, and inevitably they can come up with some kind of solution. And I think you probably validated that. Uh, for what it's worth, this is a problem that we have grappled with enormously. Uh, in one particular year as a commander of U.S. Central Command, we spent $100 million dollars on this particular problem, uh, providing people who had first a lot of computer expertise, then people that had a lot of religious training, uh, had the language skills, the dialects, uh, and all the rest of that, uh, and then getting them in rooms and, again, actually countering what was going on out there by getting into the blogs, entering dissenting voices, uh, trying to persuade people away. The challenge with that, as I'm sure you found, is that this just overwhelms those kinds of solutions. Uh, they are a drop in a very, very big ocean uh, of extremist thought and content that is out there, and that's just the visible part of it, not the telegram or the dark web uh, activities that are ongoing as well. The extremists are very, very sophisticated. Uh, they literally plan ahead for when Twitter throws them off this particular, I mean, Twitter now is somewhat getting on with this uh, Facebook and YouTube and and others are under enormous pressure, including from people like me. Uh, I personally think there should be legal, uh, there should actually be legislation that makes this uh, illegal, uh, similar to pornography, but of course it's a much more difficult problem because it's trying to get a machine to do it, because again, people can't keep up with this, so I was delighted to see that you did get into actual uh, getting machine learning or forms of AI uh, ongoing. Um, because at the end of the day, that's going to have to be the answer. But this is a much more diabolically difficult problem than is actually child pornography. The machine can see child pornography. It can identify it. It can actually automatically remove it. Uh, this is a question of when does free speech end and where does incitement to violence begin. So it's a very, very difficult problem. Um, this is one in all candor I wish I'd known about because I would have hoped that I would have steered you to uh, what used to be known as Google Ideas is now, I think, is it Jigsaw on that? So, uh, <laughs> you, you, you should connect with Jared Cohen for another you know, example or just throw Jared at any problem in the world uh, and he can, he can generally find a solution. He spent a number of years in the State Department and other elsewhere. Did you have a chance to talk to uh, YouTube at all? Should. I mean, this is crucial. Um, they have got to figure out how to take down sermons of people like Anwar al Awlaki, who single handedly is the most diabolically effective uh, individual to enable self recruiting, which is the real terrorist problem in the United States, by the way. It's not the problem of terrorists coming here. Uh, as refugees, I mean, you can't even navigate the refugee process to begin with. And so if you really want to come here and blow something up, come on a tourist visa. But it's really the self-recruit people that have been the source of the most uh, costly attacks in the United States. And believe it or not, it's a guy who was, was killed all the way back in September of 2011, uh, a few weeks after I took him uh, over at the CIA. I'm sure that was purely coincidental. Uh, but, but that individual's sermons are still very easily available, and they have to be taken down, and that's the kind of thing. So 
as you look at what it is you're doing, it seems to me you have to break it into a number of different tasks. One is just actually remove the content, take it down, um, and again, legislation would help force the, this is about social media platforms, it's about internet service providers uh, and, and those in their, those fields in particular. Uh, and then the others obviously respond to it in some cases. Uh, and this is best actually done with machines, uh, but you're getting into the very sophisticated territory of AI. This is what Google is trying to do. You can also do misdirects uh, the way anybody who ever tries to learn how to commit suicide online, you enter in, you know, how to commit suicide painlessly, and they actually send you through a different thing and says, you know, this is, you can do it in these various ways, but man, it's really painful to do this, and it always doesn't always work, and, you know, they're very skillful. <laughs> so after you're done with that, then you sort of go back to realize that life goes on, probably. Um, this is, I, th I think, what you've done is very, very important. I think it will be a help to state, although I think you'll find that we've really gone down a lot of these paths as well. Their challenge is very, very limited resources. Um, and again, a problem that is almost overwhelming. So I think at the end of the day, this is going to actually end up being resolved or addressed because you can't eliminate it uh, more by, again, the YouTubes of the world, the Facebooks of the world, the Twitters, the Instagram, and the other places where people have done a lot of recruiting, inspiring, command and control, sharing of how to make explosives and all the rest of that. None of which should sit on there uh, the amount of time that normally does sit before it's taken down. But uh, very, very impressive briefing as well, by the way. You get my vote for briefer of the year, at least until we see the next <laughs> One thing, I think, just for those who are actually visiting and haven't spent a lot of time at USC, um, one reason that both General Cowley and I are here uh, is because this is about the most military and veteran-friendly campus in the United States. Uh, it is extraordinary in the way it reaches out to uh, veterans, encourages them to come here through community colleges oftentimes. I'm actually the faculty advisor of Student Veterans uh, Association that is here as well. They're, they're spectacular uh, students here. Uh, the veterans that uh, are here are, are treated very, very well. Uh, yellow ribbon for all of them. There's a, a, a resource center for them. They, believe it or not, get the same priority uh, as football players, which is saying something <laughs> or signing up for classes uh, and a whole host of other initiatives that have been pioneered by Max uh, and others over the last five or six or more years. It's the only campus I know of of a major uh, institution that allowed ROTC to stay on campus during the Vietnam War. Actually, I take it back. MIT allowed it as well, so a really good company. Uh, and Again, this place is just extraordinary in that regard. You're not going to find people wringing their hands here because they're doing something to help the Department of Defense or state or government or something like that. There are normative uh, issues that surface from time to time, uh, but it is truly an extraordinary place in that regard. So it's a pleasure to welcome those who haven't spent a great deal of time here. Uh, this is my over five years here now, and it's a, a wonderful place and, and great to have you all here. And I. By the way, I have to say I've, I've always been a little bit skeptical of these kinds of issues where you you know you find a problem out there and you throw people at it and they do something for five months and produce something of value. And uh, this is already starting to just prove my <laughs> So I know we got to move on real, real quick. Did you guys talk to IBM at all? And, okay, so, so what what you're doing, uh, we already do for clients. Um, so it's called Watson Notebook uh, Analysis. Okay. So I'm sure you've seen some of our Watson commercials. So we do social. So what you're really talking about is social. And, and I know we got double E's, et cetera, here, but it's social analytics. So we and many companies have been doing social analytics for many years. Uh, predominantly for commercial clients, where we've applied social analytics along with artificial intelligence, particularly notebook 
an analyst, which is a Watson, and we're able to use the Internet of Things and target a number of different sources to be to help anticipate and be predictive in nature where someone might be in terms of revitalization. And uh, we're not doing it for the State Department. We haven't uh, picked one spend the money as, as uh, General Trace mentioned. So <laughs> it's kind of funny. We don't really work for free. But my my point is is social anal. So you should, I remember you. I'd find out what's going on in social analytics with big companies okay. as a product, and then and then look at Watson. Uh, analysis and um, I'll get with you over the reception. And for those of you that are graduating, if you'd like some uh, possible internships at IBM, I'll help you out. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, may I introduce you to the next team? Please. Thank you. Come on up. So, as they're coming up, come on up. Yeah, you can give them a hand. <laughs> So, as we're coming up, I'll give you a little backstory. We've been together about 15 weeks, um, and you know, a little behind the scenes. It was about uh, week three or so, or week two, two and a half, somewhere in there. I got a request from office hours just for con. It's not a good sign when you just get a one-on-one -on -one office hour request. You kind of you sense there might be something wrong, and Tom comes up and he's like, "A really important question to ask you." What's what's happening? Everything okay? Con said, "Yeah." Are we ever going to really build anything in this class? And I said, Con, absolutely. As soon as you interview enough people to find a big problem to solve, you can build whatever it is to solve that problem. So that made him happy enough to keep continuing. And so, General, you know, we, we, we do approach the, 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 the backward mentality, if you will, and that's <laughs> to find a solution to build something for it. And uh, let me introduce you to the folks here Kyle, Lily, Con, Aspen, and Monkit. Please, Team Q. Welcome everybody to Hacking for Defense. This is the New York City, City skyline. The, the events of September 11, 2001 profoundly changed how we approach security. Our, our solution attempts to take a look at how they can possibly do a little bit better. I'd like to thank Major Matt Wolfie and Dr. Moore from the Engineering Research and Development Center of the Army um, for bringing this challenge to the USC and making the trip out here for Pittsburgh, Mississippi. TQ has a great set of skill sets. I'm Commander Kyle Weaver. I'm a Navy F-18 pilot by trade and a geospatial data scientist at heart. Aspen is looking to build a new world with an MBA. Bud gets our techie. His passion is developing apps and bringing mock-ups to life. Lily is our only undergrad. As an industrial systems engineering major, she combines both tech and business. And Khan, he's a computer and electrical engineer in Always a skeptic, he's over there judging you right now. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine it's 5.33 in the morning. You're on All-American Highway with 30,000 of your best Army buddies, all trying to get onto Fort Bragg for PT. <laughs> Have you noticed this? <laughs> Maybe he was fired yesterday, or perhaps he has a felony warrant out for his arrest. In any case, he's mad. He's mad enough to have a car full of propane containers Unlikely scenario, Hartman. This is Travis Air Force Base in Northern California just three weeks ago, where a very similar event occurred. When we first started, our project was, was very broad in scope, and I'll talk about how we narrowed it down in a few slides. What we eventually came up with is, how can an installation commander ensure that his workforce can get on base in a timely manner while simultaneously maintaining the level of security in order to protect them? He needs a few things to count on in order to do that. He needs to have trust and confidence in his identification procedures. He needs to be able to respond to threats in an appropriate manner. And he needs frictionless entry. What do we want? No, no eyes at the gates. gates. How do we do that? <laughs> okay. That seemed to be part of our problem. What it came down to was a fundamental balance between convenience or efficiency and security. When we first started this process, like I said, the, the road was broad and there were many paths that we could take. Uh, you know, we looked at a whole bunch of different areas. We looked at natural disaster, terrorist attack, policy issues, was it a cooperation problem? All of this together, we through our analysis, we, we found out that there wasn't a major problem with any of this. You know, 
plenty of small issues, lots of minor inconveniences, but there wasn't a single pain point that we could identify. So we went back to the, uh, the problem sponsors at the ERGC and said, how about we focus specifically on cage security? Over the 50 interviews that we did, cage security was always a, you know, a, a piece of the, the, the discussion. It never was really the main focus on many of the, the interviews, though. Uh, you know, Aspen went to uh, Fort Carson in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He was allowed on base with no visitor's pass, no military ID, just a California driver's license. Our solution attempts to kind of change the equation of the way that you know, efficiency and security uh, equation work. Let me introduce you to 123GO, GO for general orders. Our concept is based on the, the 11 general orders of the century. The solution brings together a consolidated, simple security recommendation based on all of the information available. Those of you who were in the military or are in the military will recognize this list. For the rest of you, let me explain why this is important. The gen general orders of the century are perhaps one of the first things you learn and memorize when you go into military service. And they, they form the foundation of how we approach security. The beauty of this unique solution is that it uses existing technology and mature technology that's already out there. It will incorporate a sensor uh, like facial recognition, undercarriage uh, anomaly detection. It will look at license plates, compare that to DMV records, to vehicle type records, compare that to military photos that are, that are being uh, captured. There's live video feeds. There's proximity scanners for ID so that you can continue to move in your vehicle uh, while scanning your ID. All of this addresses some of the physical security aspects, but the true value lies behind the scenes. Those sensors we just saw are incorporated with, uh, with data from national law enforcement, military database, and other sources, and fed into the 123GO recommendation. By the time a vehicle reaches the gate, the uh, neural network will have collected all this information and made a very detailed uh, assessment of whether or not this vehicle or the person should be allowed onto the base or not. This is far more efficient and far more accurate than any human could do uh, without automation. It will provide a very simple output, good to go or not good to go. But behind the scenes, it's also connected to directional gates, pop-up gear barriers, uh, directional signage so that you can corral a vehicle over to a manual inspection area if it's required. The beauty of 123GO is that it increases both efficiency and security through this unique process. Some of the recommendations we have for ERGC if they choose to, to go further with this to uh, develop the 123GO engine, start with data. The training data for this uh, neural network will allow uh, a solid prediction that can then be uh, subsequently updated to sensor data and database information uh, for individual bases. Additionally, Look at the bases that are out there. There could be a configuration where we can do a, a pilot with very little, uh, uh, little work. Additionally, with the information, you can see if there's any sensors that, that can be optimized so that we can design, design a configuration that can be installed at, uh, at new locations if required with minimal cost. With that, are there any questions? This is terrific, actually. Um, you know, I, I was a commander of an installation uh, at the same time that I was a division commander of the great 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault. Um, and we had 25 to 30,000 soldiers on that base at any given time, probably 10 15,000 15,000 dependents, that some of which you know, lived there, at least five to 10,000 civilian workers, probably 5,000 daily guests, visitors, transit, whatever, especially because there was a museum on post as well. And this was a diabolically difficult problem in the wake of 9-11, and then in the wake of further domestic incidents, such as the attack at Fort Hood, the one that you talked about, that was just the latest uh, example of that. And so a very, very tough issue. And I really like the solution that you have. I literally was writing down what kind of sensors because again, the problem has always been it just takes too long, even with military ID, just to scan the, the, the barcode. I mean, again, you've got thousands of people all trying to go in, 
all at the same time because they all have to report to formation for PT at 6.30 in the morning. And we never had the courage to, to stagger those uh, you know, formation times or anything like that. That would be too radical. <laughs> so, this is a really, really good solution. And I guess the question, though, uh, and there are several that do pop up right away, do you have any rough estimate of the cost of gathering the data, storing the data, uh, creating the systems that can actually access the data, and of course all the different sensors at probably, you know, Fort Bragg alone. By the way, I was the chief of staff at Fort Bragg, and that has actually 50,000 soldiers and many, many more uh, dependents than others. Uh, so the sheer challenge of this, uh, I think Bragg must have at least eight or ten if you add in Pope Air Force Base entry control points, uh, if not more. So who's thought about the cost? So I think the first thing um, that we realized throughout this process is that every base is very different from sure. each other. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, the system will have to be customized to each base. Sure. So as a pilot base, we'll probably choose the one that has the most existing infrastructure that's already there and just implement whatever else is additional necessary. Um, we haven't came up with a specific number, but um, that's the goal that we're looking for. I think it would be very interesting just to take one gate and just say this is roughly what you would need for one gate, uh, and this is what the cost would be, just roughly. Um, you're going to have to talk a bit about the data and everything else, because again, you're not just building facial recognition, you are building license plate recognition, you're going to have a variety of other sensors. Um, and so again, I think it would be very interesting. I think, unfortunately, you're going to find out that the cost is not trivial. Um, you know, we obviously wrestled enormously with this in war zones where we're trying to keep out the suicide car bombs um, and where you were not worried about the efficiency, you're worried about the security. And uh, we did an enormous amount of uh, different biometric data collection and all the rest of that. I mean, people forget the lengths to which we went. Pollution, a city of three to 400,000 people before the war was a no drive zone. You could not drive your car in there. So we literally had to make everybody park outside, shuttle in. So there are lengths that you go to for security, but here you've got to have uh, efficiency. So I think just having a generic estimate for a generic gate uh, would be a great first step. Did you look at all at concerns that this starts to get somewhat Orwellian in nature? How do you, how do you, you know, I, I got it, it you know, it, Going on to a military post, you generally surrender most of your rights anyway. Uh, you actually do. There are signs that say that you are, you know, you can be searched at any time at the whim of whatever, uh, any, any corporal in the military police. But what? Yes, sir. We, we definitely uh, looked at those kinds of challenges. Uh, you know, whether or not we can look outside the gate and kind of predict, you know, who might be coming to base. You know, that comes into some intelligence oversight uh, concerns. Uh, like you said, each base by purely by entering onto the base, you're uh, consenting to search your, yep. uh, your, your body, your equipment, your uh, belongings. Um, so that's a bit of an issue. Uh, one of the things we considered about sharing data with uh, external agencies like the uh, FBI uh, and you know law enforcement, local law enforcement, uh, has to do with minimizing the slice of data that we would get. So instead of saying, you know, this guy has this warrant, he has, you know, he's you know, this, this activity, you can just say that we need to take a look at it. We don't need to know a whole lot of the background. So that kind of limits some of the, uh, you know, the data vulnerability as well. Did you talk to uh, any of the service installation commands, like the U.S. Army installation command? What, is, what was there? Yes. Did they get excited when they saw this? Or? Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was it was definitely uh, we realized that it wasn't just the military who are excited to do so. Yeah. So a lot of people got excited, really. Yeah. Um, but we're hoping that this word gate security first is what we're looking at as a general, but we're making sure to get so. Who else has questions? Cross examination. <laughs> yes. Uh, give me a your sort of footprint and time frame you need to observe. Uh, a lot of bases have maybe a 300-yard run-in. Some may have a mile run-in. Uh, 
sometimes you've got to send the colonel to the road when you can see them for a sensor. Do you have an idea for what uh, what duration of observation you need or what sort of a footprint? You don't have the exact uh, how much length you need, but uh, you can, I can say that uh, this can be fairly customized. If there's not enough room for a sensor, the system will still work, but uh, the efficiency improvement will be there. So, premises security is also a major issue in the commercial context. In connection with your research, did you talk to any of the major commercial premises security companies? Because some of this integration has already been achieved by those entities. Uh, it's one of the leading entrepreneurs and uh, big VCs of, uh, of this area and has been heavily involved in the real deal and some other initiatives. So uh, we talked to Gatekeepers. It's a company out there that does have a cert, I would say, half of the technology together, where they are already analyzing uh, vehicles entering into buildings, uh, commercial buildings, or malls, or uh, now they're working with the Border Patrol to uh, to get a contract with them, where they're doing the undercarriage uh, scanning and uh, uh, facial recognition. So uh, they are they are working with a lot of different commercial uh, uh, businesses out there. But uh, the extent of where what we want to have as security and what they were providing wasn't exactly the same because what they're building actually is the whole machine and they, are, they don't have the real software behind it. That what we are looking in is mostly uh, machine learning and uh, being able to automate, uh, automize this situ situation. Yeah, so uh, like you said, like most of them were individual machines, right? So what we're looking at is taking the output of those machines and using machine learning to give an output of whether um, the assessment of vehicle and whether like the vehicle should be allowed to enter or not. So it's basically like a human thinking, like given these outputs, should I let the vehicle in or not? So. It's, it's risk. It's risk assessment. It's uh, yeah. high risk, low risk, but it's patterns of behavior that you're going to have to teach. Yeah. So it's, uh, I would say that this is extensible to Coast Guard and uh, the port inspection, but it's also extensible to embassy security for personnel and foot traffic. And I would say that the Israelis have done a pretty good job on the border crossings to and from Palestine. So there might be a little bit of, of knowledge already out there that could help as we look to take this program to sort of the next level. I'm sure startup nation has a lot of I see a really good boons in technology. I mean, take, for instance, the tragedy of YouTube just a few weeks ago, right? So big corporate, you know, would definitely have a requirement. But when you're talking to the military um, customers, if you will, like I would I would emphasize that this is really a force protection uh, opportunity. You know, you're uh, not replacing them as much as you're helping the installation of force protection. Um, and the whether, whether we were like uh, unless we're using a mop or standing on, on the gate for you know eight hours, you, the ever vigilance of your technology really helps based on you know, that. If somebody's got all that throughput for Brad or Fort Carson, um, they're going to be at risk. So I think this is fantastic. I think it'd be great to actually figure out how to do a prototype. And again, you mentioned having a test site. I think it'd be just really interesting to tinker around with uh, certainly designing it first with some kind of guide uh, technology and then actually doing it, just seeing what you learned out of that, or that could be a great follow-on uh, to this. Well, thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. I'm going to invite the next team up, uh, Team Magic Wire. And uh, before coming here to USA and having the opportunity to serve as a teaching assistant for this class, I was actually in Afghanistan briefing all these journals, and before that I was in the Pentagon uh, even briefing more journals. So I am glad to introduce this team because they did all the general officer briefings, and they did all the Pentagon visits this semester. <laughs> And I didn't have to do any of them. So <laughs> with that, I'll introduce uh, Miles Wright Walker, who will introduce this team. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are Team Magic Wire, and we are sponsored by the Air Force Office of Meeting Insurance. 
uh, who has instructed us to help secure our nation's energy infrastructure. We'd like to thank, uh, before we begin, our sponsor, Eric Greensbach, who is also here. All right. Now, before we begin, please allow me to introduce myself and the team. Uh, as said, my name is Miles Bryant Walker, and I'm a second year uh, master's student in the Science Security Engineering Program, and I'll be graduating this May. Uh, we also have Walker Pollard, who is a first year master's student in the Computer Science Program, concentrating in Computer Security. Uh, the Victorian is also a first year master's student in the Computer Science Program, concentrating in Computer Security. Uh, Joshua Insel, who is a first year master's student in the Science Security Engineering Program, and last but not least, Rafael Dowd, who is our second year MBA student and will also be graduating this May. Now, as you see, the initial uh, promising we were given by the Office of Insurance was very broad in general. And it was our goal to utilize the Lean Startup methodology that we were taught in class in order to narrow and scope this down. And we accomplished this task through conducting over 90 plus interviews with the Department of Defense, the Air Force, and within the industry. Now, one of our most impactful interviews was with, uh, within the Department of Defense and Air Force, it was with Gerald Bosch, who is the energy based manager at Edwards Air Force Base out in the Mojave Desert. Uh, when we interviewed him and his team, they informed us that one of the major pain points within the Air Force was in integrating new technology to abide by SB 83, which is a senatorial bill uh, that requires bases that produce more than a megawatt of power through their, through their uh, renewable energy assets to send off their metering data to utility companies. And of course, this would, possess, uh, would pose a lot of security threats and risks towards the base. Uh, on the industry side, we also interviewed with uh, David Alexander, who is the CISO for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Uh, from our interview with him, we learned exactly what the responsibilities of utility companies were in regards to SD83, and also how the utility companies were potentially secure their information systems. Now, as I said, we utilized these interviews in order to narrow down the scope of our problem. And we found that the three major pain points the Air Force felt was in uh, quantifying the risk, because that was very difficult, in order to justify the cost of implementing these cyber solutions, there's also issues with the complexity of the assets, uh, making poor asset management. And last but not least, there was a knowledge gap due to the fact that the Air Force had difficulty in retaining many of its trained and skilled employees. Uh, for this reason, our solution is focused on developing a trusted communication platform that would be able to uh, communicate with utility companies time critical information that they need. Uh, furthermore, our goal is to be uh, simple, as we do not want to fight complexity with complexity. Now, uh, before we get any deeper into this, let me take you through the journey that we had. It first started off with our visit to Edwards Air Force Base, in which we, as I said, scoped down our project and learned what the pain points were within the Air Force. From there, we got buy-in support through demonstrating and uh, showing our design concepts to uh, Lieutenant General Stacey Harris, who was the uh, Air Force's Inspector General. From there, we went down to Boulder, Colorado, and and a hackathon hosted by MD5, in which we were able to successfully prototype and demo our uh, project. We actually built that within 48 hours. Uh, from there, about two to three days later, we traveled to the Pentagon, as Schultz said, and we presented our concept to the uh, CTO and the CISO of the Air Force. Now, uh, before we got into the uh, development and the validation parts of our project, we first needed to understand what the threats at which Air Force Base and Air Force Base is likely to face. And in a recent alert there, we have been verified that the Russian government is targeting our infrastructure. So for this reason, we can assume that many of our uh, adversaries and threat agents would be highly skilled criminals or nation states that had the resources to cause harm. Uh, for this reason, we can assume that subversion would be their uh, method of choice when attempting to penetrate and uh, avoid detection when getting to our systems. And as a result, we have to assume that they are at the edge of our network, hoping and trying to gain access to whatever assets they want. Uh, for this reason, we architected our uh, magic wire design to prevent this from happening, of course. Now, this is achieved through uh, offering a centralized monitoring system, uh, a database of whitelisted commands that only allow authorized actions, and lastly, uh, segregation between the Air Force's highly assured domain and the utility company's lower assured one. Uh, for this reason, uh, we also want to incorporate cost savings and avoidance into our project as one of the pain points we identified was there were a limited amount of funds available to integrate these new solutions. Uh, for this reason, we proposed to have an interface that would enable the contractors and the vendors to not have to reinvent the wheel when attempting to acquire an authority to operate uh, on base. And that's simply by connecting to our 
our uh, API. And if you have any questions on that at the end, Robert or Dowd, our business team will be able to answer those. Now, as I said also, we prototyped our design at the hackathon. Uh, one of the major differences is that our interpreter is a Raspberry Pi that we built up, which is connected to an Arduino uh, system, which is integrated with some circuits, and that in service that industrial control system. Uh, however, in, in uh, respect to time, if you have any questions on how this works and how we set this up, please take it at the end. Myself, Vic, and uh, Walker, and Josh can answer any of those questions. Now, on our path forward, uh, what we hope to do next is to have a meeting and demonstrate and show our concept to the director of the Air Force's Civil, Civil Engineering Plan, or AFCAP. Uh, after that, we hope to get a meeting with the Air Force Secretary, or the Secretary of the Air Force in order to hopefully gain any funding or gain more support. And lastly, we wanted to uh, go to an accelerator so that we can move forward in production. Uh, as I said, we are Team Magic Wired, and at this point in time, we'll take any questions. Well, this is hugely impressive as well, but can you go back a couple of slides? Yes, sir. To the one that actually, you know, I obviously, wait, the one forward one. One forward one. Yeah. You know, I, of course, understand all this stuff on the That's left right. side here, but there may be someone in here who doesn't <laughs> <laughs> understand that. It, it, it seems to me that that's uh, pretty impressive stuff. Um, I mean, is this truly unique, do you think? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we've already believe that. Uh, Walker, do you want to answer this? Um, so there are solutions like it. Um, when we talk to the CISO and the CTO of the Air Force, um, they express a pain point where vendors uh, like Lockheed and Honeywell will come to them with a solution that may have a piece of this and try to sell them the entire um, the entire solution um, instead of our our design is really trying to simplify things for them in mission readiness only the mission critical commands that are needed for the base. Did you get any uh, sense of an opportunity to actually try this somewhere? Absolutely. So there are two avenues. Uh, first of all, we're going to be putting contact with uh, Ed Oshita, the new director at AFCAC, from our contact at the airports or within the Pentagon, so that we can build this out at the Civil Engineering Center, as well as we have uh, Zion at Edwards Air Force Base in order to build and install and prototype such a device in order to uh, solve their communication problems uh, in the short term. If that gets approved and goes to the Air Force Research Laboratory and passes the TRL uh, program, then we can deploy it in more states where such a legal requirements necessitate such a solution. It's obviously a hugely topical issue to me. It's been publicly announced that uh, Russians and Chinese and others have been inside the SCADA systems, yeah. our electrical grid in most of the parts of the country, uh, inside water system controllers. So we are looking at a solution with a data diode, um, and we are trying to implement our own proprietary protocol to handle that. Um, because for SD83, it's currently just uh, metric data, um, just pushing metric data out. So we think we can create a protocol, a secure protocol, to handle that. Are it protruded or back inside of a hard one? Um, in a hard one. We're thinking of yeah, a, a hard one. Yes. Yeah. A bus, essentially. So where in the stack are you doing that? Um, level do you offer that, that absolute assurity that nothing goes beyond that's not in your life? Yeah, uh, so how we have that set up is that, for example, in our prototype, the SCADA system would send a command to a database of what appropriate commands that can be done. So for example, um, how we have it set up is if you only know English and 
uh, someone tried to tell you left, right, or whatever it may be in another language, you won't understand it. However, until you're told exactly what commands you understand, uh, you won't operate. So within our uh, design, how it works is that we have a log and audit of historians, and that takes all of the commands that have been, <laughs> that have been uh, taken and looks and notifies us of any uh, anomalous activity. Uh, from there, we are able to authenticate what commands are approved and what aren't, and then tell the uh, ICS or industrial control system to do what needs to be done. Uh, but like Walker said, for FB83, all we have to do is get metering data. So there's no possibility of attacker being able to turn something on or off. Others, please. Searching questions. Challenges, guys. And I would note that we do have time for the reception to have many questions and challenges. Okay. Thank you all very much. This is very interesting. So it's my honor to present our last team and introduce them. Uh, they're working on a problem that was also ripped from the headlines. As we all know, there are many natural disasters that take place around America, and the Air Force is often asked to fly patients to new hospitals uh, to support. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Team Ready Patient One and James Webb, to tell us about the solution that they've developed for the 18th Air Force. Got a few excess slides to get through. <laughs> you guys have lunch. <laughs> All right, here we go. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is James Webb. I'm with Team Ready Patient One. I'm joined today by my teammates Robert, Jintha, and Jake. We're all master's students at USC with backgrounds in computer science and informatics. There's some natural disasters we can't anticipate. A great example is the earthquake that struck California only a few weeks ago. The USC early warning system went off. Ten seconds later, we were hit. And we were lucky this was a 5.3 magnitude earthquake and not 8.3. And as Dr. Grish has pointed out, we're long overdue for an earthquake of that magnitude. Now, an earthquake is different than, say, a hurricane. With hurricanes, we can sometimes have up to several days of advance notice and be able to prepare our emergency response infrastructure accordingly. And when we think about emergency infrastructure, we think about some familiar images. Firefighters, hospitals, even FEMA specialists coming in to help survivors. But what most people don't think about, or at least what I didn't think about before starting this project, was the extent to which the U.S. military, specifically the 18th Air Force, plays in moving patients from hospitals in affected areas to hospitals in safe areas. Now, this patient movement process is part of a system called the National, Dis National Disaster Medical System, or NDMS. Now, there's a huge problem with NDMS. In order to facilitate the movement of patients to receiving hospitals, the 18th Air Force relies on those receiving hospitals to send them capacity information, what's known as bed count capacity or bed reporting data. And this bed reporting data is often highly inaccurate. Now, before we really got started on this project, we had some initial questions we wanted to answer. Number one, is bed availability data inaccurate because it's being inaccurately entered into the federal system? Number two, are these data inaccuracies causing patient movement coordinators to have to manually track down this data? And number three, are these data inaccuracies causing major delays in patient movement and care? And I'll talk about our journey a little bit. We got outside the building, we conducted over 60 interviews with sources from the military, civilian governments, and from industry. Now, the first thing we wanted to do is get a better understanding of NDMS. We worked heavily with our contact with the military and the Air Mobility Command to take what was essentially an alphabet soup of military acronyms and try to map out a process that explains the flow of patients, resources, and data through NDMS. We then started to look and see, is there anyone that's doing patient movement particularly well? We ended up looking at California. Obviously, it's pretty close to us, and we were able to, we're, we were aware that California was known for having a very robust patient movement infrastructure. And as we talked with, um, as we talked with public health officials from different counties across California, we came to understand that many of them were using digital bed reporting systems in order to facilitate patient movement. 
So then we decided to do a deep dive into these digital solutions. We looked at folks from industry who were building digital better point solutions, such as Intermedit, ReadyNet, and a slew of competitors that have widespread use across the nation to understand how these solutions work. This finally took us to the real problem. This was a big moment for us because up until this point, we thought our major problem was that Fed reporting data was being inaccurately entered into the federal system. But what we realized is we did not have a problem so much with inaccurately entered data, but with stale data. As a matter of, or as a point of policy, the federal, uh, the federal Fed reporting data is only updated every two months. So when a national disaster does happen, this data needs to be entirely Fresh. Otherwise, a patient could be sent to a hospital that cannot accommodate them. Now, this data refresh process can take up to several days to complete, and for a patient in critical care, minutes matter, the critical condition. Uh, with a better understanding of MDMS and the problems associated with it, we started looking at possible solutions. Now, just as a reminder, mission building in an MDMS context is a process through which the 18th Air Force re regulates patients in affected areas to hospitals in safe areas. Now, clearly, two months is not, not a viable option going forward for the frequency that data gets updated. Real time would be the ideal, but there's some obvious challenges associated with this real time requirement. Firstly, it's, you know, it's a major cost to hospitals to ask them to have to constantly update their bed reporting <coughs> data. And number two, it's a huge integration issue. Many of these hospitals use disparate systems to manage their own capacity. So that pointed us towards some technical, technological solutions to these problems. Like I mentioned, we had already identified some people from industry that were working on digital bed reporting systems that allowed for the continuous pulling of hospital data, and that exposed APIs that allowed them to integrate with these disparate hospital systems. Now, currently, none of these commercial providers are being used at the federal level for patient movement. And although we've identified them as good candidates, there would still be some gaps that would need to be overcome namely the API or the integrations with hospital systems would actually need to be built, and we would need to get buy-in from the administration of these different hospitals in MDMS. Now moving on to our way forward, the Air Mobility Command, our problem sponsor, is very excited about the potential of these technological solutions. Uh, and we're currently investigating next steps with them. If one of these solutions or one of these commercial providers is chosen, we believe the VA hospital system would make for a great beachhead market for us. Uh, number one, it, the VA hospital system constitutes a large portion of the hospitals in NDMS, and its top-down organizational structure would make an ideal candidate for a large-scale implementation like this. Now, we also are still having a buy-in problem. Although the AMC recognizes this stale data issue, it is not a top priority. We believe in order to demonstrate the severity of this current gap, we need to run full-fidelity simulated stress tests of a non-notice event like an earthquake. Now, the military is already doing this pretty well abroad in foreign conflicts. However, this capability is lacking on the civilian side. And in order to close this gap, we would require cooperation from stakeholders from the military, civilian governments, and industry. Thank you so much. That's another very impressive team. And uh, I think you honed in on the problem. Uh, I'm not quite as certain solution though at this point in time and so what again is the next step where you hope to do how do you attack this problem so currently we're trying to get um, again buy-in from uh, Air Mission Command and um, the idea is they understand that there's a problem but the severity is unclear so if we we understand that like Teledyne uh, they use a system called I think it was J Joint Joint page, yeah, yeah uh, JPMP that is used a lot, um, and they have modules for like hurricanes, but they don't have modules for like earthquakes. And the idea is maybe get them to implement such a module that you can um, create these like stress tests to show that if a thousand patients need to be moved immediately, like the system can't handle that. And to piggyback off of that, once we get that buy-in, the idea of our solution going forward is. We've discovered there's already these digital systems that are handling uh, bed reporting very well. It's the idea of taking those solutions, which you know have some widespread use across the country, and specifically focusing it towards NDMS to serve their needs. I mean, it really almost strikes me that this is more of a Washington D.C. problem than it is that getting either the Department of Homeland Security really energized on this, or some member of Congress who sits on the relevant committee. 
chairman of the committee who can drive, and this might actually take legislation, right. uh, but it's also going to take some resources because, it's, it, as you noted, it's going to cost more for hospitals to constantly update. But this is really about civilian uh, hospitals with beds, right. uh, maintaining much more accurate reporting systems uh, and, and keeping those up to date. So again, figuring out what's the architecture for that, who is actually going to receive those, because it's not really an Air Force. I mean, it's an Air Force problem when all of a sudden the Air Force needs to know where to take people. So presumably there's an organization above even that that is telling the Air Force it should have the responsibility of, again, identifying where these patients should be taken by the Air Force, which is what it is uh, their job to do, along with, frankly, there's a lot of civilian aero medevac uh, both fixed and rotary wing, um, the biggest of which is actually owned by KKR, in which I'm a partner, so if you want more information, I'm <laughs> happy to do that. Um, but questions from the floor on this one, please? Another very interesting, please. Do you consider um, looking at simulation, um, trying to simulate an actual event with some current uh, databases to see, like, uh, create Yeah, I think that is an excellent idea. What Rob brought up earlier is the tool currently used to create these simulations. It's called JPMT, and they are limited in that they are only simulating per. They, we don't have the immediate the simulations for immediate disasters such as an earthquake. And please correct me if I'm wrong here, guys. But if we had a means of simulating the ter the type of disasters that would really show to be poorly responded to, given our current system, such as an earthquake, where we have almost no, no premeditation to, you know, to try to prepare for it, we don't yet have a way to simulate that and to test our solution. So that would definitely be a goal in the future of us to try to lasso that together. So again, I mean, that's, that's our way forward. That's the, hey, we ran the simulation, like, yeah, we made, we made the simulation, we ran it, we saw that NDMS can't handle this, and that's where you get, like, people want to handle the severity of it. But yeah, that's that's where we're trying to go. Again, yeah, that stuff's really on the civilian side, not on the military side. Mm -hmm. uh, the military here is really more of a provider than an answer uh, than it is the consumer, the driver. Right. And so you've got to get the, the civilian side of the military, medical system uh, engaged on this. And so convincing someone, again, that this is a hugely significant problem that needs to be resolved, but I, I really see this as being outside the Air Force and outside the DOD by and large, unless I'm missing something. That's, that's our understanding, too, in terms of like funding, that they can't fund it. Like it's, uh, they can't mandate it. Right. So we were looking at HHS maybe trying to fund it and kind of going that way. Right. HHS, it could be, and also be Homeland Security. Right. Because obviously they do a great deal of the post-disaster uh, responsibility. They're the on-site commanders and this kind of stuff. So uh, usually, if, as always, it's going to be some kind of interagency solution. But uh, again, I think it's about getting somebody in Washington energized about this. It's just part of the overall effort to improve uh, not not just the resilience, but also, of course, the response uh, in the case of some kind of natural disaster. By the way, there are startups out there as well. That are looking at this very subject as one of the Palo Alto called One Concern, uh, which also tries to help 911 911 services understand where to go when they're inundated by calls, and they do it with big data to predict which are the most disastrously affected right. uh, areas. So that's yet another issue. And you probably could get assumptions out of that as to the magnitude of some of the problems as well. Any other final questions? So you guys mentioned that it takes two months for the, the information to get updated and then up to 48 hours for that information to re-update should the uh, incident occur. Um, is that manual intervention? Or is somebody actually going around the hospital cutting beds or is that just taking 48 hours for the software or whatever logging capabilities they have to 
So hospitals actually usually have this down. They have their own system, uh, like all the EMRs, and for them, bed count, of course, is very important. It's not the specific hospitals we worry about. It's that's the hospital's data will get sent to a coordinating center, like the Health Massachusetts Institute Federal Coordinating Center, and then that information is then pushed to uh, a system called Traces that like is, is involved in, in keeping that data, and so that that is is what gets up like the push to Traces is what takes can be up to two months old. So th that's like the issue, is, is that hospitals may have that data, but to get to that other system is taking too long. Uh, and this is a manual process to push the data to the traces. So sometimes it, actually it can be automatic up uploaded. It, it should be a way forward, but now it's not. It is manually uploaded. So it, sometimes it is the old data, or sometimes it may be very uh, uh, say, uh, slow. Yeah, not the automatic process per se. Sure. Do you consider block, uh, blockchain technology? Because what you're, again, maybe I misunderstood, but so you're looking at an assessment issue, but then when it gets to implementation, and I agree with Jennifer Clay, it's really not a technology that be, it's not, and you want to get funded. Blockchain is really an accounting problem, okay? You want to track people, things, in this case, hospital beds. Blockchain technology, that's what it's for. It allows people to plug and play, to integrate different security walls, and it can be automated, and it can be refreshed. And what you want to do is you use blockchain technology, plug it into what you're talking about, and sell it to civilian hospitals, and give them the capability to plug and play with the, with the larger uh, disaster relief organizations that would be in the state as well as at the FEMA. So you might want to look at the blockchain. Right, yeah. Talk to anyone at Cedar Sinai Accelerator. Because they're interested in developing this kind of you know, you're talking about hospital system technology. Um, and Cedars is funding the development of this technology and interestingly is funding it with in partnership with other hospital systems because they believe in the promotion of your investment and non rival technologies in the system. What's your name? Michael Bula. Anyone else? Thank you very much. So I realize I'm the last person standing in front of some fancy meats and cheeses and some beer and wine where we'll have a lot better uh, discussion and further deepening it. But uh, I want to take one moment and talk to you about the mission of Indian and that is to build new communities of innovators solving national security problems. And I think we've done that tonight. We've seen that mission in action. Uh, not just the 18 students who present, but our military colleagues that are here, the investors, um, all of us together from academia, uh, students joining and, and, and working on the community problem. So I want to, to the students, the teaching team, on behalf of Team Red Better, which I should suggest you all ask Cliff why, but <laughs> Uh, I want to say thank you for your effort this semester, for your dedication, and for the tremendous amount of hard work you put into it. So, to you. Well, lots of water here. Obviously, we can't do it without your problems. Uh, for those in the room who could be future problem sponsors, bring us your problems. We want them, please. Uh, to Feisty Belts, who has embraced defense innovation at USC so wholeheartedly. Thank you. And she put together the teaching team, uh, and this course would not be possible without her. General Petraeus, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for supporting the nation of the U.S. Uh, now, let's go have some fun. Bravo. And I should add, you're now a part of the Innovation Insurgency.